Good morning and welcome to another vlog by Danny the Digger and this time I'm really quiet yet very excited to give you a report from such an amazing place. People, I'm inside a church, a church from the time of the Crusaders. It is about 800 years old yet I'm in the heart of an Arab Muslim village of Abu Ghosh. And this church, besides its amazing decoration from the time of the Crusaders, also holds two significant traditions. The more famous one is the, the possibility that this site is the site mentioned in the last chapter in the Gospel of Luke, the site of Emmaus. Yet another more remote possibility is that the church was commemorating the station of the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, which I've been reporting in the last few chapters, was captured by the Philistines, placed in Ashdod, in Gat, in Ekron, and then returned to the Israelites in Beth Shemesh. But causing a plague also in Beth Shemesh, we are told in the book of Samuel chapter 6, I believe, that it was taken by the priest of Vinadav to Kiryat Yarim. Where is the site of Kiryat Yarim? Later, I will come out of the church and point to the hilltop above the Arab village of Abu Ghosh, whose Arabic name is Der el Zahar. Der means monastery. Zahar? What is Zahar? Maybe it's preserving the name of the son of Avinadav, El Azar, who was placed in charge of the ark for 20 years. The local Arabs, furthermore, also called the hilltop of this village is the holy mountain, Jabal Muqaddas. So maybe there is truth, a grain of truth in the vague local memory that this site is associated with far back biblical events. But first of all, let me review this amazing church, which again is 800 years old, yet after the crusaders were expelled from the Holy Land, the church was turned into a stable, into a den. It was later abandoned, and only in the 19th century was it redeemed, was it purchased again by the Christians. And when they started cleaning it, and especially when they removed the plaster, the filth off the walls, this amazing original Crusader era images appeared. Okay, they are representing different topics. Let's review them. So the first one over here is obviously the crucifixion. The images have been vandalized, especially the faces, and especially the image here in the middle of Jesus. But you can see the two thieves in the back. You can see the family grieving over the crucifixion of Jesus himself. And this is undoubt the subject of the crucifixion. There's an interesting, there are interesting details like the person here holding a sponge at the edge of a stick that is supposed to hand it over to Jesus. A kind of surprising detail in the story of the crucifixion that someone was handing him a sponge soaked with vinegar? What was he trying to do exactly? And there's another interesting note of two figures there in the back. One is called Ecclesia the church, and the other is called synagoga. This is already Christian apologetics of Christianity removing Judaism. The next image over here is portraying, well, you can only see a saint whose identity is not clear and the back of a horse. Who is the figure galloping on that horse? Well, usually in Christian art that will be Saint George, but it is not certain if this is the case. And here, above our heads, is a vague image left of three seated figures. Without the text, it would have been difficult to identify them, but the text indicates that these are the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, so the church is alluding both, relating both to events of the New Testament and the Old Testament, and wait, as it, we will see that there are also possible links to the very story of the Ark. Now, 
This is a very peculiar, I bet you've never seen such decoration in Crusader churches. And this is indeed a local imitation of local Muslim architectural elements. Muslim art is very non-figurative, but it does a lot of geometric forms. And this is undoubtedly imitating uh, such Muslim, especially Mamluk era decorations. Moving on to the central aisle, above our heads up there, you should be able to see the image of Jesus and the disciples. And on the left wall over here, there's also a surprising subject. The faces are again vandalized, but you can see clearly a person in the middle with a halo over his head, Jesus. And on the side over here, a figure that should be laying down. Its face is again vandalized, but it's undoubtedly the, not the death of Mary, but her falling asleep by Christian belief, although the New Testament does not say it, she didn't die. She fell into a very sound sleep, and Jesus took her up to the heavens. It is interesting that this little story, which is not originally from the New Testament itself, becomes very important, very strong in Christian history and Christian narratives, and appears quite often, especially in Catholic, medieval, and even modern images. Okay, next to it over here again, we have a saint whose identity is not clear, and again, some sort of a hero, some sort of a figure on the horse. St. George again? Who knows? Here on the top is the medieval subject of the diocese of Jesus reigning the globe. But one subject does not appear in all of this, and that is what this church, what some claim that this site is commemorating the site of Emmaus. Emmaus, according to the Gospel of Luke, was the place where Jesus appeared after his resurrection, except that he says it was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now, there is a city called Emmaus, Emmaus Nicopolis, a whole city around Latrun Junction of today, but it is uh, about more than twice far. No, that's, prob that's not proper English. It is uh, over 20 miles away from Jerusalem. It is more than twice the distance. So some suggested that the Crusaders, realizing the distance isn't correct, have identified Emmaus over here, and this church was made to commemorate the appearance of Jesus. I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just wondering why did they not depict this event, this story, anywhere in the frescoes? On the other hand, on the main aisles on the, and main columns, excuse me, over here, the Crusaders did choose to depict two specific figures. One, on the left, John the Baptist, the forerunner, but on the right side, Aaron, Aaron, the high priest from the Old Testament, the high priest that made the golden calf, but later was in charge, he and his family and his descendants and the, Ko and the Kohanim, the priest of the Ark of the Covenant. So maybe this is a clue to what the Crusaders were really commemorating in this church. Well, if this is not enough of a mystery, there is also a crypt beneath this church. Not very well lit up, so I hope the camera will be able to catch it, but follow me. Okay, it is very dark, but 
there is actually some beautiful morning light coming from the outside. Wow, almost mystical. I hope the camera is catching this. And this is quite interesting because the crypt is actually built over a local spring. Okay, a very dark lower level that seems to relate to a water source. Is this connected in any way to a males? Or to the story of the Ark? Who knows? Let's continue exploring the outside. Okay, surprise, surprise. It turns out that there are lights here. <laughs> So let's take a closer look. The construction is undoubtedly Romanesque style Crusader era. This was all built in one stage around the 12th century probably. <laughs> but without proper historical documentation, there's just no way of telling why was it built here? I don't know if the camera can catch the water here, but there is a small spring. But what I find very interesting is the fact that you have two, or a double stairway leading to the bottom. This is not common in wells, it is common in holy crypts. And this might suggest that perhaps the spring, the water, had more than just a significant water supply. It was also considered as sacred. Let me see if I can get out of here. Yes. It was also maybe considered as a sacred place which is why there was a crypt designed around the water source. And if this is not enough of a mystery, in the outside courtyard, you also have here a coffin, a sarcophagus. A sarcophagus with an interesting design over the lid. It is somewhat reminiscent of the Jewish um, Rosetta design, which appears a lot in tombs, but also in other forms of art. Is this indicating that a Jew was buried here? <laughs> well, another item that is embedded here on the wall on the left is a Roman, a clear Roman um, tabula ansata inscription mentioning a vexilato, a certain unit of the infamous 10th Legio Fretensis. Yes, Legio Deca Fretensis. They are quite infamous from a Jewish point of view because they were not only one of the three legions to conquer Jerusalem and brutally crush the Jewish rebellion, but the 10th Legion itself later stayed here, stayed, I mean, in Jerusalem for 300 years to make sure those damn Jews don't even think of rebelling again. And only in the days of Diocletian where they moved from Jerusalem to a lot. Okay, the site actually has both a beautiful, quiet vibe to it, but also a few more archaeological artifacts that makes you only more and more perplexed. Like this Corinthian capital, maybe from part of a Subbuilding and the extension of the church here, by the way, is what it looks like today. The entrance, and I see the monks 
Sitting them on the side. Bonjour, Olivier. Bonjour. I'm recording a vlog. How's your English? Not so good. Not so good. So we'll skip it. But this is a vlog in English that I'm doing for my YouTube channel. Okay. Later I'll talk to you. <laughs> Bye. And no, no, I'm salam at And uh, in the courtyard here, you can see also elements of an olive press, which can really be from several periods, indicating the rural countryside, the nature of this area. But what I find especially interesting is this milestone. Aha! Milestone usually contain names of emperors and indeed the name of the emperor on this one is Antoninus Pius. This is a milestone dating to the second century when the Romans, after crushing the Jewish rebellions, both the first and the second, apparently tried to put some order and order also included marking the roads and fixing them. And Abu Ghosh, needless to say, is along the significant road between uh, Jerusalem and Jaffa, or today's Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. In fact, until the 1970s, the main road between those two cities passed right through this village. Only in 77, I believe, was highway number one completed. And then Abu Ghosh became a little road station uh, on a road, on a local road system. Although now it's quite famous among the Jews, among the locals, it's a good place for hummus. <laughs> but that will be a different chapter. I'm noticing another Corinthian capital over here. All of this is mysterious evidence to the rich and not very well known past of Abu Ghosh. But once again, maybe it can be related to the site of Emmaus, maybe it can be related to the story of the Ark. And my next chapter is going to be exactly that. It is going to present the possibility that the Ark of the Covenant was placed on the hilltop, Der el Zahar, the highest point in Abu Ghosh, where new archeological research is suggesting that this actually finds dating to the early Iron Age dating to the time of the Ark. So long for now. And of course, if you want to get more information, watch more of these presentations, hit subscribe, okay? Help me out. <laughs> Bye for now.